Hello, my name is Stuart, the Unrepentant Atheist, and thank you for visiting my channel. And today I'm going to talk about a debate that I watched between Michael Kona and uh, John Crossan. So I've not really uh, come across this scholar before, Crossan. I know about Michael Kona, of course. So they're both uh, biblical scholars, and from what I understand, um, Lacona is more or less orthodox, believing in the resurrection, etc. Uh, the whole sort of modern <clears throat> orthodox Christian package. And um, he takes the resurrection literally. In other words, Jesus uh, really bodily rose from the dead. And as for John Crossan, he is an Irishman who was a Catholic monk and he believes that uh, the resurrection is uh, figurative, metaphorical, that there's no real bod body, bodily resurrection and it's metaphor, which he argues is more powerful than the real literal thing. So uh, it, it, it wasn't too long a debate and um, it, was, it, was fairly, it, it was fairly brisk the way it moved on. Obviously they did their presentations and um, Lacona was arguing that because we're talking about ancient times that we need to factor this in when we are looking at uh, the Gospels um, uh, as a historical document. And um, he cites some examples, Plutarch for example, who, who he said uh, makes mistakes and it's not reasonable to expect that in the New Testament there won't also be mistakes, but this is not a reason to uh, discount the uh, historicity of the entire document. <clears throat> he also makes the claim that there are eyewitness accounts in, in the Gospels. And um, he more or less goes through what you would expect most of most of the uh, New Testament scholars, Christian New Testament scholars, to to say that, for example, you would not expect the gospel uh, writers to say anything which might be embarrassing to the cause, and because they do this, it's evidence that they are sticking to they're determined to stick to the truth, and that if they stuck to the truth on an embarrassing uh, detail such as for example that women were the first on the scene and they were the first to bring back news of Jesus um, being seen alive um, when the tomb was empty after discovering the empty tomb <clears throat> they would only include this as a detail if it was actually true and consequently one can trust everything else that they say okay so that's his that's that's part of his argument he he had quite a lot to say but Obviously, I'm not going to go through all of it because I don't want to bore you. And obviously, this is a review. It's not a, I'm not going to give a rundown on the entire thing. But so Crossan then came on and he, he, kind, of, he, he kind of dealt with those points. Uh, he said that when we're trying to de determine the historicity uh, of a document, in other words, did did these events really happen <clears throat> it's not enough to say that well there are there are other um, unreliable sources around at the time and because it was the ancient world that is what we would expect <clears throat> so he's not really interested he he doesn't think that's a good argument and he thinks that uh, Christianity or the Gospels are so important that we need to verify as much as we can the events which which happened and moving on from that he did actually comment that it's important because unlike other texts from antiquity the gospels are claiming something uh, quite spectacular they're not simply describing wars they're not describing political events they're actually describing something which is fantastic and they are they're describing obviously supernatural events the 
the whole narrative of the resurrection, etc. It's not just it's not just a fairly simple uh, historical claim that one might expect to find in um, you know Tacitus and some of the other uh, events that Josephus talks about, which are fairly mundane, to be honest with you. So he moving on moving on to what's more interesting though moving on to what's more interesting i want to go straight to it really because i've titled this video because what came out of it for me a couple of things is that lacona quite interest lacona is more or less saying that yes in his summing up in the question and answers i think it was that because people were, were asking the question uh, you know what's so what's so great about the metaphor? Because what we found, what we like about Christianity is that Jesus really bodily rose from the dead. And if he didn't do that, then what is the meaning of the metaphor? And for Crossan, the meaning of the the meaning of the metaphor of Jesus' resurrection is that what he died for was passive resistance, peaceful resistance. It seemed to me from what Crossan was saying that his whole take on the Gospels, and maybe there's more to it, I need to, I need to watch more, is that Jesus' message was actually passive, uh, peaceful resistance, not non-violent resistance to the Romans, for example. And that's what he died for. Uh, he died without a blow being thrown uh, completely, completely passively. And... Crossan sees in that a hope for mankind. In other words, one of the one of the big issues with the whole history of the world has been wars and uh, violent resistance or invasions, etc. So, if we if we take the message of the resurrection, which is one of peaceful resistance, and there are there are and if mankind can learn from that and there are going to be no wars, then obviously there won't be the same misery. That's, to be honest with you, I was a little bit disappointed that that is Crossan's take on the Gospels because as an atheist, I'm not completely indifferent to um, the figure of Jesus. And I don't, I don't take from the metaphor of the resurrection the same thing that Crossan takes. I agree with him to a large extent that it is uh, it is metaphorical. I think that a lot of it is, and even if it's not, even if the even if the evangelist did intend to say that yes, Jesus bodily rose from the dead, um, the beautiful thing is you can take uh, you can take a metaphorical reading on it, frankly, without being a Christian, because obviously I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in God, but. Uh, obviously, I do believe that Jesus knew what he was talking about, and even though they tried to corrupt the message uh, over the centuries, I think that obviously there's a lot of there's a lot of wisdom in there, which Crossan just didn't really touch on at all. Maybe he will in other videos which I'm going to watch. But his main take is peace. Now this is where Licona comes in, because when Licona was asked about you know. Uh, the metaphor side of it, he dismissed it. He said, well, you know, metaphors are all very nice and everything, but we can find metaphors in Narnia, tales of Narnia. We can find metaphors in Lord of the Rings and, you know, Harry Potter even. Uh, and um, it's all very nice. But uh, he was saying that um, what's going to sustain him if he's ever faced with, for example, the possibility of torture or execution, what is going to what is going to make him strong through that experience is knowing that Jesus died and rose uh, to eternal life, and that he, in other words, Michael Kona, will do that too. And I found that really interesting. Also, in conjunction with the fact that people who were asking questions, several of them were saying, in fact, there was a man who came. I said, oh, "I've been married to my wife, you know, thirty years. I love her and everything. And what keeps us going?" is the knowledge that um, at the end of this life uh, there will be more we will 
in our love for each other, we will be reunited in the afterlife. And this is what Christianity promises. So for these people, many in the audience, there were others who were also saying similar thing is that un unless Jesus bodily rose from the dead and unless they can rise from the dead as well and have an afterlife, then more or less Christianity is of no use to them. Now this flies in the face of what a lot of Christians have said to me on uh, comments pages when I've challenged them and said, look, you know, you're only Christians because, or at least, um, are you not, a, um, you know, I'm not making a claim. Are you only Christians because of an afterlife? Is that a big deal for you? And they've all almost to a word said, no, 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 that's not the deal. It's all about, you know, love, love for mankind, helping your neighbor, turning the other cheek and, uh, you know, all this other stuff. No, 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 we're not bothered about the afterlife. Oh yeah, sure. And it seems to me that when a, when a scholar who is a Christian is challenging this thing, um, about the afterlife because Crossan said no no when when we die we're gone and it's about what we do in this life you know because there's there's nothing after it and I love that I've been waiting for a Christian to come along <laughs> and say um, there's no afterlife that it's just a metaphor and you know deal with it you know we're mortal we're gonna die when we die the lights go off forever tough that's just the way it is no matter how much you might want it to be not so that is the way it is and uh, every, the the resurrection Jesus did not actually bodily rise from the dead it's just a metaphor um, of a message of passive non-resistance uh, against evil and peace peace for mankind that's all it is which actually not that's all it is that is that is a marvelous thing and a marvelous hope uh, for the future of man ironic isn't it because in the ta past 2000 years we've had more wars somehow uh, that message has fallen on deaf ears we've had more the crusades and all the you know all the all the wars that we've had uh, over the centuries and the millennia so uh, and maybe because Christians over the ages have been saying oh don't worry about the wars you know it doesn't matter if we die in a war especially if it's a war against um, Muslims or whatever um, because uh, there's an afterlife isn't there so you know it doesn't matter if we die in a bloody war in this life and uh, maybe that's why there's been so many wars because um, uh, people 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 haven't been really heeding the true message of the Gospels I don't know but as I said to you I don't believe I'm gonna do another video on what I think the meaning of Jesus is and what his teachings mean um, I actually think that his, just briefly, I think his teachings have got a lot in common with uh, what we find actually in Buddhism and other uh, Eastern religions. Um, but it's been, it's all been corrupted. So, yeah, so, so the point is that for Lacona, the metaphor is useless. Crossan's vision of Christianity is useless. And not just for Lacona, many, many Christians, from what I can see, and what I always believed. Um, even though I didn't have the, uh, nobody's, I think, done any studies on this. Oh, actually, no, I have seen one study where more than 50% of Christians claimed that the afterlife was not the main reason for believing. But, I mean, how trustworthy is, is that? Because as Lacona said, if you take the afterlife away, all of a sudden, um, he's not going to follow Jesus. He's not, Christianity is of no use to him. Now, I admire him for that. I admire him for being honest. And the afterlife is such a, I mean, eternal life. Nobody wants to die, really, unless you're in terrible pain. Nobody wants the lights to go out forever. And um, for the rest of eternity, trillions, millions and trillions of years uh, for the rest of eternity. And we're just here for the blink of an eye. And then it's all gone. I know that um, I can't remember who it was. Uh, was it Mark Twain? He said that I'm not afraid of death because before I was born, I wasn't alive and it wasn't a problem then and it won't be a problem after I've gone. Yeah, true enough. But um, before you were born, uh, you, you'd had no existence anyway. But once you've existed and you've had a family, you've had uh, been able to construct some meaning out of reality, you're invested in it. So naturally, you're going to be afraid to lose it. So in a way, it's not really relevant to say, well, 
before I was uh, born, not being alive wasn't a problem and it won't be a problem after I'm dead. I mean, actually, to be honest with you, on the whole, I kind of agree with him, but I can see why I can see why people would object to Crossan's um, metaphorical interpretation of the resurrection because Jesus does actually, in the Bible, offer eternal life to uh, those who believe in him. Um, I am the way, the truth, uh, and the light. So um, I don't really, I don't really see that Crossan. I, I actually see Crossan is barely a Christian. He's got a lot more common with. He's got a lot more common in common with atheists. I know that he believes in God. That's the <laughs> that's the one thing. But he's certainly a very sort of strange Christian, and I look forward to discovering more like him. So obviously there was an impasse between them. It was kept very friendly and everything like that. And I do like the way that Crossan speaks. He speaks with a lot of authority and he's got tremendous knowledge. And I think he's absolutely right in all his uh, criticisms. He, he dismisses a lot of uh, what is said in the Bible as uh, the Gospels as hearsay. There were no, um, there are no first-hand accounts. It's hearsay. In other words, Mark, for example, um, or one of the evangelists who claims that he's got first-hand accounts, um, he's heard stories from people. He's heard second, third or fourth hand accounts uh, of eyewitness testimony. And it's come down and after 30, 40 years, he's writing down these so-called eyewitness accounts. So that's not really an eyewitness account. Um, I mean, an, an eyewitness account would be uh, a first person account of somebody who was actually there. Or at worst, it would be uh, a named person who a journalist was talking to and reporting it. It wouldn't come through two, three generations or, you know, um, 10 different storytellers in the oral tradition. So in that sense, I think that the Gospels are much less reliable. And as Crossan said, uh, there, are not four G there are not four gods, <laughs> so why should there be four Gospels? I really recommend that you watch this. I'm, I'm not going to give any more away and I've spoken too much already, but uh, I did enjoy it. And I would like to see, I would like to see more of this because we focus too much on, I know I'm an atheist, but I mean, I'd almost, uh, instead of wasting time on the transcendental argument, presuppositionalism, um, uh, first cause arguments, etc., and all this stuff, that Chris, Christians are hitting atheists with, thinking that they've got trump cards. Um, I'd almost like to say, all right, okay, let's suppose God exists. Okay, you know, I'm not, I'm not granting your arguments, but let's get past that. God exists. Now, how do you get to Christianity? Because that's what we should really be talking about. You know, and I think that Christians are focusing on um, arguments for the existence of God, when they should be focusing on arguments for their religion. Because they're, they're preventing, they're, they're getting hold of the narrative and presenting their arguments for the existence of God. And supposing somebody said, well, actually, first cause I went, yeah, actually, yeah, all right. I think you're right, God does exist. Okay, so now let's talk about Christianity. How do you get from a deistic God who, uh, with his finger, got the universe going and uh, kicked off evolution with abiogenesis? All right. How do you get to the Christian God? Let's talk about that. And really, in a way, that's what Crossan is doing. He said, all right, there's a God. Now, let's, let's talk about uh, Christianity. Let's talk about the Gospels. How historically accurate are they? And I find that more interesting than all these useless um, arguments for the existence of God, uh, all of which have got a fl one flaw or other. Because obviously, if there was a watertight argument for the existence of God, all, philosoph all philosoph philosophers would be theists, and they aren't. I don't know what the split is, but supposing it's 50-50, I actually think it's more like probably 80-20 in favour of atheism. But <clears throat> I would think that 
if these arguments were so powerful and so convincing that the people who are really trained in philosophy would find the transcendental argument utterly convincing um, and not just maybe 20-30% would find it convincing. Uh, in other words, uh, mo obviously theists and m the majority of those being Christians. But it would be more like 80-90% or even 100%. If it's that convincing, I would expect um, all philosophers to be um, theists, and they're just not. So why are we wasting time on all these uh, arguments? And I'm having to waste time on them. Or say waste time because they're being they're being presented and we're not getting time to critique Christianity that's why a lot of my videos you'll find um, I'm more and more getting into critiquing Christianity instead of um, crit critiquing God arguments for me the God argument is a closed book it's it's closed as as some have said if if there was an argument so convincing that it couldn't be refuted truly um, then I would expect all those academics to be theists, and they're not. I can spot flaws in these arguments, and I think that it's only uh, believing in God first and then using the argument to support yourself. It's like the chicken and egg situation. You're, you're just begging the question, really. First, you believe in God because you've had an experience, or you think it just makes more sense, and then you're going out and you're finding arguments and you're using those uh, jumping straight to Christianity from being an atheist, a lot do. And that baffles me too. I'm going to do a video on that. How somebody could be an atheist and then, oh, two minutes later, uh, they've had an experience and they love Jesus. That baffles me. It really does. Okay, well, enough. Um, I'll put a link below for the uh, debate, Crossan and uh, Mike Lacona. Uh, I did think it was very good, actually, on the whole. I, I learned quite a lot from it. That's all from now. That's all for now. What do you think of what I've said? I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there, but you know, I don't know. Maybe it's more interesting than if I just absolutely stick to the topic, but it's all kind of related anyway. So uh, see you again soon. Bye.